I saw it. It's good to see y'all back tonight. Uh, man, we are creatures of habit. This section fills up. We got a few here, a few there, a few there. Uh, if a church fight ever breaks out, I think this side's got the advantage. But, uh, but anyways, it's good to see you back tonight. A couple things to remind you of uh, as far as uh, announcements. A couple things are coming up. Uh, two weeks from today, Brad Marchman from the uh, Georgia Baptist uh, Mission Board's Evangelism Department will be with us. Uh, he'll be preaching on Sunday morning. And Sunday evening at this time right here, he'll be doing uh, a presentation slash training on no sweat evangelism. I want to encourage you to be here for that. I think you'll be blessed by it. I think you'll be challenged by it. Uh, and we just need to be thinking about those uh, outside that do not know Christ, those uh, that we come in contact with, whether it's in our neighborhoods, in our families, at our jobs, wherever it may be. And think about gospel conversations. The Great Commission is still the same. Uh, we're to go there for and tell and make disciples. And so just to uh, give you some more ammo to use, uh, it may be that you, know, you don't maybe like the no sweat evangelism. Well, it's kind of like fish. You can eat the meat, spit out the bones. Take it. Uh, somebody said to, uh, to D.L. Moody one time, they said, sir, I'm not sure I like your evangelism methods. He said, well, I don't really like them that much myself. Tell me about yours. And they said, well, I don't have any. He said, well, I think I like mine better. So, you know, uh, so at least uh, give it a whirl, see what you think of it. Uh, that is in two weeks from today on uh, August the 14th. Uh, and really, other than honorarium, it costs us nothing. Georgia Baptist pays his mileage, pays his room, uh, his meals, all of that. Uh, although we'll probably take him to Sweet Teas or Western Citizen somewhere. We'll take him for lunch. Uh, but then uh, that. Then uh, revival services begin on September 14th. That Sunday morning with Tim Hall from uh, Camp Pickney. Tim doesn't need any introductions around here to most of you. Uh, this is his home church. And I visited with his uh, aunt and uncle, uh, Paul and Sue Hall, on Friday, which is also Blaine's aunt and uncle, but different sides of the family. And I was like, oh, man. I was thinking that scared me a bit, a bit there because I was thinking Blaine was kin to Tim, but uh, I, I know better now. But anyways, Tim will be preaching, and then Aaron Quick uh, will be leading our worship. And I'm not certain, just yet, I believe he'll start on Sunday morning, and so he'll be leading our worship through Wednesday night. Uh, looking forward to that. That Sunday night, September 11th, we will have a fellowship after church that night. Uh, I was told this morning that I didn't remember what the date was that this was the fifth Sunday and that we didn't have a sing. Somebody called me Friday. Well, Brother Ray called and asked if we was having a sing tonight. And I said, no, not, I hadn't got one planned. I didn't think anything about fifth Sunday. So uh, it's going to be a fifth Sunday preaching is what it's going to be. Hey, there will be a fifth Sunday singing in just a couple of seconds, a couple of minutes. We will be doing that. But, so I didn't think about that. But anyways, uh, that's going to, then on Sunday, October 9th, is homecoming. Now what I've been told was that Sunday school that morning only, Sunday school will begin at 10.30, worship will begin at 11.30. That gives people, uh, other churches that want to come uh, to be a part of that. Uh, Brother Mars is going to smoke at least one chicken. And I know who that one chicken's for. <laughs> well, we're going to have some more chickens than that. Suzanne, I need to talk to you about that too. Uh, real quick. But anyways, uh, huh? No, no, no. I have a connection on some chicken, though. But anyways, uh, we will have plenty of food that day. Uh, we won't have any eating services that night. So that's uh, October 9th. Those are things that are coming up. Uh, I'm not aware of any other announcements, prayer list. I just uh, remember uh, Miss Susie and uh, Miss Lars family. Uh, they laid their brother to rest yesterday. Uh, Horace Pete Thomas, so remember that family. Um, any other updates or prayer requests? Yeah. 
have breakfast or supper that night. Okay, that's on Wednesday, August the 8th. Uh, no, uh, that'd be the 10th. You need to look at your calendar real quick. The 10th. That ain't no good. I'm having a tooth pulled that morning. Man. Oh, well. All right. Uh, huh? Who is that? Wiley Hickox? All right, uh, what, you said he passed away when? Today? Yesterday? His funeral is when? Okay, when's the funeral? Tuesday, okay. Then where? Fernandina. Oh, Fernandina, okay. All right, anything else? All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then I'll turn it over to Brother Ray, and uh, we'll sing some songs and worship and get ready to look in Revelation. Father, thank you again for your love for us, which is immeasurable, which is eternal. And Father, um, help us to always be amazed by your love for us. Your word tells us that your mercies are new every day, that your grace abounds over sin. And Father, we need abounding grace. And we need those mercies that are new every day. Father, may we never think that we've arrived, that we've gotten to the point where we can just settle in and settle down in our walk with you. Lord, help us to continually uh, to press ahead. Uh, as the Apostle Paul said, that we press toward the mark of the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Lord, help us to set our minds on you. And Father, may we be mindful that it's very easy to slip back. And Lord, as we look forward to revival services, Lord, just because we have services and call them revival, that is no guarantee that revival will occur. We have to prepare our hearts. We have to prepare our minds to, to hear and to receive and to respond to what you would say to us. And Lord, may we not just wait for a series of meetings. Lord, revival can begin tonight, uh, tonight. It can begin in each of our lives the moment that we fully surrender to you. And Lord, I just ask that you would lead us in this time of worship tonight, that you would be pleased with our worship. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. Let's all stand and sing, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. <clears throat> Hey. 
God, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings of life, Lord. We just thank you, God, for another opportunity, Lord, to be in your house tonight, Lord, to worship you, a true and a living God. And, Lord, we just pray for those that's on our prayer list, Lord, the, the ones that are sick at home, Lord, that can't be here for some reason or another, Lord. Just be with them, the ones that's lost loved ones, God. We just pray, Lord, that you be with those families, Lord. And, God, for our services tonight, Lord, I just pray, God, you be with the singing, Lord, the, the piano playing, Lord, the, and the preaching, God. We just pray, God, that everything we try to do out here, Lord, be for, for your glory, because it's all about you, Lord, not about us. And I pray, God, you forgive me where I fail you so many times in life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat>
Take your Bibles and let's go to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation 3, we're going to look at verses uh, 1 through 6. The church at Sardis, as we look at these letters to the seven churches. And Jeremy, I'll throw that picture of the map. Not that it makes a whole lot of difference to you, but it just kind of gives you an idea to see. Um, it's what's known as in the area, the country we now call Turkey, is where these churches are located, seven historical churches. We've looked at Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, or Pergamus, Thyatira. Tonight we're at Sardis. Uh, only two churches receive commendation and no complaint, no criticism from Christ. That is Smyrna and Philadelphia. Next week we'll look at Philadelphia. And then three weeks from tonight we'll be at Laodicea. Uh, and so we will finish that up. Uh, because in two weeks, Brad Marchman will be here with us. If you're there in Revelation 3 and you're able to, ask that you stand for the reading of God's Word. We'll read uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy." He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask your blessings upon this time. We ask that you would help us to understand, help us to grasp your word, what you're saying to us. And Father, I pray that we would give attention. And that, Lord, that we would seek to remedy anything that you reveal to us that we need work on in our lives, either as individuals or as a corporate body of Christ. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I've said this a couple of times as we were, we've been going through these letters to these seven historical churches. If Jesus were to write a letter to us, Pleasant Hill Baptist Church, what would he say? I don't know. I'm not Christ. But I want you just to think about that for a second. As we've been looking at these churches, Jesus most definitely has a message for us. He has a, a plan and a purpose for Pleasant Hill. And he has a desire for us to fulfill his will. What would he say to us? You know, I had uh, an endoscopy done on Thursday. Not yet got the results back of all of that. But imagine I get the results back and then I look at the doctor and say, I'm fine. Now, hopefully the results come back, everything's good. They just, you know, he saw a few things, but uh, hopefully everything's good. But can you imagine going into a doctor and having blood work and the doctor coming back when you get the lab results back and he sits down and goes over and says, there, there's some things here. Your cholesterol is high. We need to get that under control. Uh, there are some issues with the uh, electrical rhythms of your heart when we did the EKG uh, or the EEG, whatever it is. But uh, 
I'm not a doctor. But anyways, when they hook you up and they do that stuff, he said, we saw some things there, some irregularities with your heartbeat. Your blood pressure is a little high. And, you know, there's, you, you, you need to lose a few pounds. You know, you're a little bit overweight. That's always, you know, we don't want to hear that. And, you know, imagine us looking back at the doctor and saying, but doc, I'm fine. I mean, you can tell me all that stuff, but doc, I'm good. I'm okay. Well, now there is the professional looking at the blood work, looking at the lab work, looking at the results of the test that he has ordered to be done on you, and then you're going to tell the doctor, hey, I'm good. That's what it would be like for a church to say to Lord Jesus, Lord, we're good. Thank you for your input. Thank you for your suggestions. Thank you for telling us that we, we might need to do this or that, but Lord, we're good. But I'm afraid that's too often the pattern that most churches and most individuals take. We don't want to take the steps that the Lord would have us to take to, because let's just be honest. I think a lot of times we're fearful of getting close to God because we think we're going to have to give up some things. And let me just ask you this. What are you going to give up on this earth? What are you and I going to give up that is worth holding on to that when we get to heaven we'll say, man, I don't know how I ever made it without that. I wish it was here with me now. It ain't going to be there. You know, and so we need to understand that. And Jesus, in writing to these churches, addressing these churches, addressing the concerns that he has with them, we now come to the church at Sardis. Um, perhaps the church I would say that the harshest critique is for is Laodicea. But Sardis does not get by Pergamos, Thyatira, Ephesus. Ephesus, you remember, had left their first love. We saw last week, Thyatira, they tolerated that woman Jezebel. Jesus referred to her, this woman, this prophetess that was teaching there in the church and leading them into sexual immorality and and to idolatry and idol worship. And some of them were participating in that. Jesus told them, you need to straighten up. And that's what we see here to the church at Sardis that he writes to them. And he just says, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Number seven is the number of perfection. And Jesus, again, identifies himself to each church with a part of the vision that John saw in chapter, that we see in chapter 1. When he turned around, when he was in the Spirit on the the Lord's day, and he turned around and he saw the, the risen Christ there. Jesus identifies himself, and he says here, I know thy works. See, that's the thing we don't need to ever forget, is that God sees everything we do. He knows exactly why we do it, the motivation the attitude behind it, if we're doing it for the right reasons. As we saw this morning, the Pharisees had this false righteousness, and their righteousness was for the world to see, to be impressed with them. But what we want to be is filled with the righteousness of Christ, and that our motivations and that our uh, actions and our attitudes are, are all because of the right reason that we're serving after Christ. And he just says to him, I know thy works, that thou hast a name. He said, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Now, that's a a pretty bold statement that he makes. He said, you've got a name that you're alive, he said, but you're dead. Now, it's been a long time since I have been to Disney World down in Orlando. I was a teenager the last time I was down. I think I was about 15 the last time I went to Disney World. And I don't really have any plans on going back (laughs) I just don't want to be amongst all them people. All right? Now, listen, I won't complain at all about the crowds in heaven. But down there at Disney World, there, I, I would say this, there will be a difference between the, the multitude there in heaven and the multitude there at Disney World. But there at Disney World, they have an attraction. It's the Hall of Presidents. And I remember going to the Hall of Presidents. How many of you have ever been there before? Or you know what I'm talking about? This is, you go in this thing, it's an it's a, uh, outstanding, I mean, it's a fabulous building they have there. And there's a film they show you, and, and then they raise the curtain up, and there on the stage is every president that we have had as a nation sitting on that stage. But they're robots. And I remember going there in the 70s. Now, in the 70s, we didn't have artificial intelligence and robotics like we do now. And <laughs> that term artificial intelligence, that's kind of a misnomer, isn't it? But 
you know, you think about that. But I remember being amazed because you look at these presidents sitting up there. There's George Washington and there's Abraham Lincoln. There's John F. Kennedy, and there are these others. And what's amazing is they're sitting up there, and they're, they're moving. And, and Lincoln gives the Gettysburg Address, and you hear uh, George Washington speaking. And I, I, as I looked it up this afternoon to make sure they still had it, they said, you even get to hear Joe Biden being sworn in. <laughs> but they, they have it, and what's so amazing is they look. I mean, you look at it, and you think, that's real people that's dressed up to look like these characters. No, nah, it's robots. They're not alive, but they move. And what's so amazing is they're sitting there, and Blaine, if you were to lean over and whisper to, to Brandy, I mean, they, they do this. There's these two presidents that sit next to each other, and they're kind of having this conversation while somebody over here is speaking, and you hear one cough, and it's just, they look like they're alive, but they're dead. They can't pass Matter of fact, they can't submit any legislation, even to Disney World. They can't do anything because they're not alive. Jesus says here to the church at Sardis, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Listen, folks, we look at this and we think, how can they... How can they be dead? Because we look at what he says to them, that when he tells them this, he says this to shake them. To wake them, because he says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. He says, be watchful. That, that, that phrase when he says, be watchful, to be alert, to be on the lookout, to pay attention. Our oldest granddaughter, Sydney, bless her heart, she's an airhead. I mean, just there's times you're like, girl, what are you thinking? You know, it's just going through life. You know, you just got that kind of little simple thing and 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 and, and that's a, there's something to be said for that but the, we have people like that today in the church that are just coasting on their christianity oh i gotta say you ask them about their salvation and they got they'll tell you about when they walked the aisle and when they filled out a three by five card when they got baptized you know they'll tell you all these things but what has the lord done in your life lately what is he doing in your life right now what has he done since the moment you went through that baptismal pool there should be growth occurring me and jan were talking this afternoon next saturday we're going over to uh josh and Lindsay's uh, sawyer turns two on Friday and we're having a birthday party for him on Saturday and we were talking about Silas and it's hard to believe he's only just three months old and he, he looks so big and he's starting to look and he's not even crawling yet I mean, he ain't sitting up by himself yet and you expect him to continue growing Jesus says here, be watchful. He says, and strengthen the things which remain. There needs to be growth occurring in our life. There needs to be a steady pattern of growth in our spiritual walk with Christ. And if we're not growing, we run the real danger of becoming a spiritual pygmy, stunning our growth. And Jesus says to them, be watchful, be alert, pay attention. He said, and strengthen the things which remain. And now, he just said, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Now he says, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. Grab hold and hold on. Because you've got a few things there. there. There's some things there that you still have. He says, hold on to them. Don't let go. He, he tells them here, there's three things that Jesus tells them in these verses. One, he says, to remember. Two, he says, to retain. And three, he says, to repent. See, there's a lot of preachers don't want to talk about repentance, but apart from repentance, there is no salvation. And see, repentance should be an active part of our life. Yes, our sins are covered by the blood of Christ. We are eternally secure. Uh, we have a home reserved in heaven, but we still need to confess and repent of sins in our daily life, in our daily walk. And not just when you lay down at night and say, Lord, if, I forget, if I've sinned any day, I ask you to forgive me. Now, you need, to get, you need to get a little specificity about your confession. Because when you don't specify your sins, you kind of have the tendency to gloss over your sins. That's true for me. you got to name them. When you want to talk about name it, claim it, this uh, health and wealth crowd, they got it wrong. What we didn't do, we need to return that, name it and claim it, name our sin, claim it and repent of it. And the Lord will honor that. And he says to them, he says, strengthen the things which remain. 
that are ready to die. If the doctor, if I told you, you went into the doctor and he says, I've got some results here that are alarming. And your cholesterol is at such a level that if you don't do something right now, I mean the time you leave this office, you're going to have a stroke and it's likely to be fatal. But there's some things you can do if you will do this right now, some steps you can take. And if you do not, you could die. Would that have your attention? That's what Jesus is saying to the church at Sardis. He said, be watchful, be alert, pay attention, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. See, Paul tells us in Ephesians 4.30 that we're not to grieve the Holy Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians 5.19, he says there, do not quench the Spirit. You know, we're given this instruction. Is it possible that you and I can grieve the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. If it were not possible, he would not have said that to us. And how do we, how do we grieve him? Well, if you go back prior to Ephesians 4.30... If you go back uh, to verse 17, I just want to begin reading there. Just let's listen so you get the context. This is in Ephesians 4, verse 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. That is a description of what we're experiencing in our culture today. People that are past feeling, they just, if it feels good, do it, they're out there doing whatever. He says, uh, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. He says that you put off some things and that you put on some things. There are some things that we're to take off, like if I were to take this jacket off and lay it down, and then there are some things we need to put on. And that's what Paul's saying here. He said, as you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and sin not, and let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So grieving the Holy Spirit is right there in the midst of what he's saying of things that we're to put off and things that we're put on, things that we're not to do and things that we are to do. And so we need to understand that, that we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. He says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, beginning verse 16, he says there, you could begin reading at verse 12, but I'll just begin here at verse 16. He says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. So right there in the middle of that, he says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, not in some things, not when you feel like it, not when you want to, in everything give thanks, and that is difficult. I have a hard time with that. I was telling Teresa this morning, don't, don't, don't get all worked up. It's hard not to. When I went for my endoscopy the other day, now, when I had my colonoscopy last month, they checked my blood pressure. said, your blood, your blood pressure's up, but, you know, you don't have a lot of fluid left in you. Yeah, you think? Uh, just saying. And, but that, that elevates your, your blood pressure, and that's why they put you on IV to kind of rehydrate you and that kind of stuff. But I said, yeah, I'm a little, you know, where you plan on putting that tube, yeah, that kind of has my blood pressure up. Endoscopy's a little bit easier, but still, 
It's hard not to get anxious. I don't like, I go to the dentist on August 10th. I bet she got to have a tooth pulled, and then she's going to have sausage and pancakes that night. I think it was a conspiracy or something. But uh, I, I get, you want to see me sweat? Let me go sit in the dental waiting room. <laughs> I don't like going to the dentist. And I'll tell myself, now, Joe, you preach this stuff to others. You don't, what you worry, what you getting anxious about? What you get? But that's part of our nature, is it not? And there's a constant battle of surrendering to the Lord's will. And so when he says here to not quench the spirit, that's in the midst of praying without ceasing, rejoicing always, and everything giving thanks. It's right there. And so when, when he says this back here in Revelation, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. He said, don't be grieving, don't be quenching the spirit. Instead, he said, remember, verse 3, remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard. Do you remember? Now, see, if, if you were saved as a child, and there's a lot of people that, that accepted Christ as a child. And because they grew up and they didn't really live what, what you might call a depraved life. They didn't go out and just do all these kind of things. And they think, you know, I've just, I've always known the things of the Lord. I don't have much of a testimony. You've got just as much of a testimony as a drunk that was saved off a of skid row. Because you were just as lost as that drunk on Skid Row was. And you do have a testimony. But people are saying, oh man, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. And I, I don't really remember. You don't have to remember the day or the date. It's not, we're not told in Scripture. You need to know that you know that you are a follower of Christ. And I will submit this to you. And it, even in the midst of who we have here tonight. It may be possible that your baptism is on the wrong side of your profession. You say, what? Yeah. You may have gone through a baptismal pool, but you weren't saved. And later you realize, I was lost. But I need, I realize later, after that moment, is when I've truly accepted Christ. Well, baptism occurs after salvation, not before. And so if that's you, if you're in that position and you realize I came to faith after I'd gone through a baptismal pool, then you need to be back. True baptism follows true salvation. I know that uh, because I experienced that myself. I was a lost church member. And I read, so was Jan. Jan experienced that same thing. There's a, and I'm not trying to cause you to doubt or worry or fret, those kind of things. I'm just saying, he says, remember, know that you know. And if you were saved as a child, that is awesome. But some people, I saw, uh, uh, where was, uh, I don't remember if it was in the Christian Index or if it was in an email I got. There was a guy in his 80s being baptized. That's the, I love it. You know, what the, you know what the statistics tell you about that, though? It is very, very minuscule, the number of people in their 80s that come to faith in Christ. But it does happen because our God is a saving God. And until you've drawn your last breath, you have hope. And he says, remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast. Don't let go. Hold on to the solid rock. Christ is our anchor. And the anchor holds regardless of what Ray Boltz has decided in his life. I, I have trouble even listening to that anymore. If you don't know who Ray Bolts is or what I'm talking about, I'll be glad to, to share you. But I'm like, but that song, the anchor holds. I'm glad, I'm glad it's not about me holding on to him. I'm glad it's about him holding on to me. Because if it's about me holding on to him, I'd already be lost. Because I'd already let go. He says, remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. That word again, repent just means to do a 180, to just do an about face. It's not to do a right face, a left face, it's to do an about face. And to turn from our sin. And so he tells this church at Sardis, you've got a name that you're alive, but you're dead. He said, but be watchful and strengthen. He said, remember uh, what you received and heard, hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come, upon thee, uh, come, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. In Matthew 24, 
Jesus, in speaking to the disciples, they asked him what was going to be the sign of his coming, what, what was going, some things that were going to transpire. Well, he says here in Matthew 24, beginning in verse 36, and I want you to know something. There are many today that think nothing about the return of Christ, whether you are pre, mid, or post-tribulational. Regardless of what your position is on when Jesus is coming back, he is coming back. Man, y'all are starting to get a little amen to you. We're going to work on that by the time Tim gets here at Revival. He's going to think he done stepped into a holiness church. But he says here, be watchful, be looking, be prepared, be ready. That's what he's saying to the church at Sardis. And I believe he's still saying the same thing to us. And he says here in Matthew 24, verse 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore. Watch. Will you teach your children when, you, when they learn to cross the street? Look both ways. When they learn to drive. Oh, blame, I, I hope I'm still around. When Leah and Ella and Landon and Adelaide start to drive. Huh? No, well, I just want to see this. I mean, it's, I've, I've experienced it with Sid. She's 15 and but y'all have three at one time. Okay, pride goes before fall. <laughs> uh, but seriously, I'll hear about that after church. But anyways, you know, you tell them, look both ways. Look before you go. He says here, watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman or the master of the house had known him would watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man may come. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Be ready. And Second Peter, uh, Peter says there, uh, that we need to be ready, we need to be watchful because there are those that, that mock who, who say, where, where is the sign of his coming? Where is it at? He says here in Second Peter, beginning in verse 3, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust. That's like the headlines off the news right now. He said, in saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men." But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is longsuffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. That's what He says to Sardis. He said, will come as a thief in the night. Be ready, be prepared, and you won't be overtaken. Because Paul says in uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, 5 and in uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, we, we, we shouldn't be overtaken. Why? Because we should be prepared. We should be ready. We should be looking. But he says here, But the day of the Lord becomes a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements should melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. That's what he's saying to the church at Sardis. Be ready, be watchful. He said, because if you don't, 
He said, I'm going to come on you in an hour that you'll not expect. You won't be paying attention, and you'll be caught unawares. We don't want to be caught like that. He says in verse 4, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He says, yet, there's still some there who are faithful. Just as at Thyatira, there were some that had not given in and followed the teaching of this woman that Jesus referred to as Jezebel. He says here, there's a few there. But they've not defiled their garments. They've not stained their garments. What would that be in reference to? Quite likely, because of what we saw last week with Thyatira, what was going on there, sexual immorality, idol worship. It's very prevalent. And he said, they, you've not stained, you've not defiled your garments. There are those that, that remain. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18, when Elijah, after he had that battle with the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18 up there on Mount Carmel, and then he goes and he prays for rain and God sends rain and he runs before Ahab back to the city. And the next day Jezebel sends word to him. She said, God do so to me and more, and more so if by this time tomorrow you're not like those prophets of Baal you killed up there on Mount Carmel. And Elijah takes the, run, and runs tail out into the wilderness. Kind of has a pity party. You know the bad thing about a pity party? Nobody comes. You're the only one there. And you sulk around. Sco- I, I know, I've had, I've had plenty of pity parties. Nobody ever brings me a present at my pity parties. It might, it might get me out of my pity party. And Elijah was out there, and God said, I've reserved 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal, nor kissed him. He said, I got more, God's got more people than what we think. I've often said, There'll be more people in heaven than we expect and, and, or more people than we imagine and fewer than we expect. There'll be some that we think, huh? I don't think we'll have that moment of looking around and saying, oh, they, they didn't make it, I knew it. No, I don't think that. But there'll be fewer there. And in Romans, Paul says here in, a Roman, in Romans chapter 11, he said, uh, beginning in verse 1, I'll read down through verse 6. He said, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Uh, have you not, uh, do you not know what the scripture said of uh, uh, Elijah? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and torn down thy altars and I alone am left and they seek my life but what saith the answer of God unto him I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace and if by grace and there's no more of works otherwise grace is no more grace but if it be of works then there's no more grace otherwise work is no more work in other words God always has a witness and even in these dark days of America, people think they can stamp the church out. They think they can get rid of the word of God. They think they can silence Christians. They're not going to stop the church of Jesus Christ. This church can close. Other churches can close. But the church of Jesus Christ is going to prevail. And hell is not going to win. And these that mock God, these that deny God, there are those. He says, even here in Sardis, there are those that not defiled their garments. He says, he, in verse 5, he says, he that overcometh. Uh, well, let me back up for a second, just mention something. When he says at the end of verse 4, and they shall walk with me in white, uh, for they are worthy. They are, over, they are the ones who have overcome. They, they get to wear the, the victor's robe, if you will, that, that white robe, signifying victory, that they are overcomers. Listen, we don't need to be overcome. We need to be overcomers. And I fear too, too many times that instead we're overcome. He says, he's talking about holiness. Then he says in verse 5, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And he says, he that overcometh, that means to persevere. See, as Baptists, we believe once saved, always saved. But the flip side of that coin is the perseverance of the saints. If you are saved, you will persevere. I'm going to tell you something. I believe it was Spurgeon that said, 
The only assurance of salvation you have is what, you, what God's currently doing in your life. See, if you're looking back in time to a moment and that's the only thing you have to say, well, I, I accepted Christ, I prayed a prayer, I prayed the sinner's prayer. I want you to show me the sinner's prayer in Scripture. But if, but if you're just looking back at that, the proof of salvation is what God's continuing to do in your life. Now, we know that we don't lose it because we're held in His hand. He said in, in John 10, all that my Father gives me will come to me. And, and He said, they're in my Father's hand. And I like what that black pastor said about that. When you're in the Father's hand, the devil can't snatch you out. He said, as that black pastor said, just imagine that the, that the old devil was able to get God's pinky and maybe to pull it back just a little bit. And imagine he could get that ring finger and he was able to pull that back. And then imagine he got that middle finger and pulled it back. And then he got that pointer finger and he pulled it back. He said, you know what would happen right then? That the devil would be in God's hand and he'd be saved. <laughs> he can't get you out of God's grip. God has got a hold on you. But I want to tell you this, you are, you are to continue to grow in grace and knowledge. You don't ever get to a point where you know it all. I ain't there. Billy Graham didn't get there. He is now. But not on this earth. He says, he that overcometh, the same should be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32 through 33, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. And see, Jesus is talking about persevering. He's telling this church at Sardis, he says, strengthen the things that remain. Hold fast, hold on to what you have. See, Joe over there needs a kidney transplant. But Joe could decide, I'm going to go out and I'm tired of waiting for a transplant. I'm just going to, I'm just going to go buy me a fifth and I'm going to have, I'm just going to, what's that going to do to that kid? I mean, he already has issues. That would, that would not be wise, would it not? You persevere. That kidney's coming sometime, I, hope, I pray. That it's coming. It don't mean, and the great thing I like about the fact that he needs a kidney is that it doesn't mean somebody has to die for him to get it. It could, but a lot of times somebody that's got a good kidney can donate to him. He says here, persevere, hold fast. Don't be ashamed. Don't be, a, be, don't be ashamed to stand upon the word of God. Don't be afraid to call sin, sin. What God says is sin, it's still sin. I don't care what any elected politician says. I don't care what any judge says. It doesn't make any difference because God has spoken. And we need to make sure that we hang on and we strengthen. As we move towards these series of meetings we call revival, the test of whether revival will occur or not is whether or not we prepare ourselves to receive what God wants us to have. It's a time where we focus and we turn our attention to, but revival can begin now. Somebody said many years ago, I don't, know, I don't know who said it to give credit to, but if you want to experience revival, they said draw a circle on the ground. Get inside that circle and pray until revival comes inside that circle. We sang when I was a boy, it only takes a spark to get a fire going. Who wants to be that spark? Who wants to be the one that God can use to ignite a fire? You say, well, who am I? You're his child. We don't want to be like Sardis. We want to be vibrant, full of life, serving Christ until he comes. We'll just stand and let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for the challenge and the reminder that, Lord, we need to pay attention. We need to wake up. Lord, we need to take it off of cruise control. Lord, in my car, when I'm driving with the cruise set, I sometimes catch myself not paying as well attention as I ought to be. Lord, the same is true in our spiritual walk. We can put it on cruise, which we don't find taught in Scripture, but, Lord, 
what we call cruise control. And Lord, we begin to stray. And we're always in danger of drifting out of the lane that you'd have us to be in. Help us to be faithful. Help us to be found faithful. And Father, I ask your blessing upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. Look forward to seeing you Wednesday night. We will be in the book of Hosea and our study as we go through there. So look forward to seeing you Wednesday night. I, I'll tell you something. You ain't come on Wednesday night. You're not in here for that. I give you a handout, give you a cheat sheet. But I have more freedom, seems like, on Wednesday night. Oh, I just I want to encourage you to be back Wednesday night. We'll have youth, children activities. Uh, and then the following Wednesday is when we will be having supper. Should have had it this Wednesday, but anyways. All right, it's been good to worship with you today. Uh, we'll see you then. Let's be dismissed with a word of prayer. Brother Mar, will you close us out with prayer, please, sir? Amen.